Susan Sered is one of those international scholars whose career spans multiple continents. After earning a BA from the University of Chicago, she moved to Israel and completed her PhD at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, going on to teach at Bar Ilan University in Israel. She returned to the United States to study religion and health at Harvard. She is now the director of the Crime and Justice Studies program at Suffolk University in Boston, as her career has evolved toward a focus on justice and health instead of her earlier concentration on gender and religion that we find in this article from two decades ago. Her research in Okinawa also was the basis for her 1999 book, Women of the Sacred Groves. It is very instructive to find an example of a culture where women are not excluded from leadership in religion, although understanding why and how this comes to pass is much harder to pin down. Although women have been excluded from leadership positions in organized religion throughout most of the world and in most of recorded history, some exceptions to this rule do suggest that such exclusion is not some kind of fact of nature. Women's exclusion from religious leadership results from social construction of religious reality. This interactive process can produce varying results. Susan Sered shows us an example from Okinawa in which women actually dominate religious leadership positions in society, one of the few places in the world where this happens. Okinawa is a large island in the middle of the Ryukyu chain of islands stretching between Taiwan and Japan, and has been home to a distinctive indigenous culture for thousands of years. Not much is known about the earliest millennia in these islands, but we do know that people were coming and going throughout this island chain, arriving from the south from China and arriving from the north from Japan. Many little local populations formed, influenced by trade and cultural contacts from both directions. Eventually, by about the time that Columbus was sailing across the Atlantic in the 1400s, one of these local clans managed to conquer all of the others and formed a unified Ryukyu kingdom. From its earliest days, this kingdom traded intensively with China and so borrowed many cultural additions from Chinese society. While this contact with China was mainly economic, the influence of Japan ran even deeper because Japanese came not only to trade, but to settle down and live in the islands. The languages spoken throughout the whole island chain are clearly linked linguistically with Japanese. The rivalry between China and Japan for cultural and economic influence has been a hallmark of life on Okinawa literally for thousands of years, and the result is a unique ongoing blend of these influences with the indigenous culture of the island. This unique blending process appears in the historical religious traditions in Okinawa. Each village identifies a sacred space, or utaki, usually a grove of trees or other sheltered place, where contact is made with the sacred kami, or spirits. Kami are difficult to pin down. Sometimes they appear to come from animistic beliefs about supernatural powers in all natural objects, from the ocean to rocks, trees, and other plants or animals. But kami also seem connected to ideas about ancestral spirits, perhaps developed out of interactions between local animistic beliefs and the Confucianism of Chinese traders. Some scholars see these kami as a kind of preserved religious museum that might help to explain the origins of Shinto as a religion in Japan to the north. Whatever they are, religious life in Okinawa revolves around prayers, rituals, and other interactions with the kami, preferably done in the village's allocated sacred space. But the most distinctive feature of traditional Okinawan religion gives the central role in these prayers and rituals to women. In each village, everyone recognizes one woman as the highest priestess or Nigan. Her house is the one closest to the sacred Utaki place. Importantly, we must remember that this religious leadership does not imply that the society is a matriarchy, since this Nigan position does not pass down matrilineally from mother to daughter. 
the standard pattern has been for the Nikon to be a sister of the leading man in the village who is in charge of more mundane secular activities. But women's religious power doesn't stop here. Along with this highest priestess, other women in the village also are recognized as priestesses and participate in religious ceremonies to interact with the kami. This organized side of collective religious life is dominated by women. At one time, apparently men were actually forbidden to enter the sacred utaki space. Connecting women's spiritual power to the social solidarity of kinship groups, sisters in each family have the power to act as kami providing blessings and protection to their brothers who do not themselves have access to the sacred on their own. Outside of such organized community rituals, there are also people that Swanson would identify as shamans, as those able to manipulate the sacred energies or mana directly without working through the formal channels of the kami and the community. These magicians who work confidentially with people on an individual basis are also women exclusively. Why is religion and religious leadership and power in particular a female prerogative in Okinawa? This is the question that Sarah wants to answer. She finds a few possible hints in the unique circumstances faced by the people who live on this island. Not only is Okinawa an island isolated out in the ocean, far from either China or Japan, but historically it was covered with inhospitable jungles and lacked a plentiful supply of good land for agriculture. The struggle for subsistence, for enough food and other raw materials to sustain a community, always has been hard for people living there. When such conditions do not allow intensive agriculture, with draft animals for power and technologies like the plow, the meager returns to such work have meant, all over the world, that men don't bother much to get involved with it foraging for roots and berries and doing some small-scale horticulture like growing yams in a garden are virtually always women's work, and Okinawa is no exception. This means that women on the island have always had a clear and important role in production of the necessities of everyday life. Sarah thinks that this may be part of the reason why they also play an important part in religion there. The other special circumstance to which she points again starts from the fact that Okinawa is an island. If the agricultural potential of the local soils is too limited to allow full-scale agriculture with all of its technology, productivity, and resulting prestige and power based on control of the resulting bumper crops of food, men will not be attracted to it. Leaving the roots and berries to the women, they prefer to pursue other alternatives, and the only alternative on Okinawa is the ocean. Men historically have ventured out in their boats, seeking greater rewards in a higher risk setting. But this has meant that men are often gone for long periods of time on sea voyages, either fishing or trading, and that sometimes they never come back at all. The famous painting of the Great Wave of Kanagawa, a place on the south coast of nearby Japan, brilliantly captures the fear, respect, and also excitement represented by venturing out into the open ocean in this part of the world. Sered accepts the suggestion of many scholars that the frequent absences and threat of danger and loss of men from the community caused by this maritime tradition provides another explanation for why women have ended up in charge of the transcendent religious dimension of life in such a community. But how do these people themselves see the situation? We turn to that question next. The institutionalized, stable, and persistent patterns of attitudes and behavior that we call organized religion constitute a human invention that is just as important as any technological invention like the plow or the wheel because it opens up new opportunities for people to come together and enjoy new ways to enrich their lives. Such social institutions are a part of what anthropologists call culture, a concept that includes all the accumulated results of everything, both intangible ideas and tangible objects, created and sustained by human interactions. 
The Sered shows us a dominant position for women in the religious life of communities in Okinawa forms one such institutionalized cultural creation. Where did this pattern come from? There are two basic possibilities. Either it is a special, unique, and original creation that emerged spontaneously through ancient social responses to the local environment, or else it may have been imported, so to speak, as a foreign habit of thought and action that Okinawans borrowed from visiting strangers who arrived from distant places to trade or perhaps to invade and conquer them. If the institutionalized roles for priestesses leading religious life were borrowed, then we ought to be able to find these customs duplicated in other neighboring civilizations. Sered finds that this is a historical dead end, however. Whether we look to the ancient cultural traditions of neighboring China, Korea, or Japan, all sources of long-term trade and other contacts throughout the Ryukyu Islands, we find no trace of any such invention as a dominant leadership role for women in religion. All of Eastern Asia has been dominated for millennia now by the ideas of Kung Fu Tzu, whose name has been Latinized in the West to Confucius. These ideas about family, politics, and religion form the most elaborate and enduring system of patriarchy ever known in this world. According to Confucian doctrines for society, men occupy public positions of power, while women are restricted to domestic positions within the home. Women are to obey and defer to men throughout their lives, first their fathers and older brothers while they're young, then their husbands after they marry, and eventually their sons when they outlive those husbands. There are no other known sources anywhere in East Asia from where Okinawans might have borrowed their tradition of powerful priestesses. This failure of the borrowing hypothesis is the main reason why Sered must explore her own explanations for priestesses based on the material economic realities of life in the inhospitable Ryukyu Island setting. There's another such borrowing hypothesis for her to consider, though. The pattern of priestesses with power might also have been borrowed from much farther away than China or Japan. After all, three quarters of a century ago, the United States invaded and occupied Okinawa as part of the Second World War against Japan. Perhaps the Americans brought a completely new and different kind of religious theology with them, and the powerful priestesses have been borrowed from that source. No doubt you recognize immediately that this borrowing hypothesis also won't work at all. The Christianity that accompanied the Americans in Okinawa is just as patriarchal in its own way as is Confucianism. So we're still left looking for local explanations that can be traced back to independent origin of the powerful priestesses from within the Okinawan setting itself. Sarid's discussion of the uniquely powerful Okinawan priestesses doesn't actually cite the work of anthropologist Margaret Mead, but that discussion, particularly at the end of this article, certainly reflects Mead's insights into gender and society with particular reference to religion. Mead's 1935 book, Sex and Temperament in Three Primitive Societies, became a classic study that clearly has influenced Susan Sered, along with many other people. Her goal for this book was to reconsider the assumption, still common to this day, that gender roles for men and women are in some sense natural and inevitable assignments based on universal innate biological characteristics. If gender roles are part of basic human nature, Mead reasoned, they should appear universally in all human societies in the same way that all people everywhere fall asleep at night or get hungry and need to eat some food. Human nature produces uniform results in all human beings. But her observations in these three different societies, combined with her earlier observations in the United States, clearly established for Mead that gender roles are not universal, constant, or inevitable. They are quite arbitrary social inventions that we can describe by two kinds of variations. First, gender roles can vary from one culture to another in salience, in how strongly they're contrasted between men and women. 
For example, in the United States, Meade saw gender roles as very salient, involving many strong distinctions between men and women. These contrasts gave power and responsibility for the most important activities to men rather than women. Among the Chambuli people she studied, on the other hand, these contrasting gender roles seemed to her to be equally strong, but to reverse the American pattern and give most of the serious, responsible roles in society to women. In both cases, gender roles are salient in society, clearly separating men from women and assigning them all kinds of contrasting attitudes and behaviors that they're supposed to adopt as their own. Sometimes, though, gender roles do not have to be salient in society. Babies will always be born male and female, but some cultures may not make much out of this fact, any more than assigning sharply different roles to people who are tall and short or skinny and fat. Among the Arapesh, for example, Mead believed that gender roles were not that salient in the first place. She described attitudes and behavior expected from both men and women as what we would expect here from women, being considerate and cooperative and willing to compromise. Among the Mundugamore, me de detected another outcome. Again, gender roles were not sharply different from men compared to women, but everybody was expected to be what we might consider masculine, that is, aggressive, selfish, suspicious, and competitive with others. So not only the specific content, but the salience of gender roles vary dramatically from one society to another. From this anthropological tradition of comparative cross-cultural study of gender roles, a general pattern has been detected around the world. Institutionalized powerful roles assigning important responsibilities for women tend to appear in societies where families trace matrilineal lines of descent from mothers through daughters, rather than patrilineal descent from fathers through sons, and where extended family households tend to be matrifocal, that is, husbands join the households of their wives rather than wives moving into the family compounds of their husbands. How does this fit with Okinawa? We get an important clue from Sered's recorded conversations. Although her respondents told her in clear and positive terms that their families are patrilineal, tracing descent from children through the fathers, and that wives were supposed to go and live with their husbands' families, Sarah observed that this cultural rule mostly was not followed in actual practice, and that in many cases a woman and her children continued to live in her own mother's household. The abstract cultural model in people's heads did not match their actual behavior in everyday life. This discrepancy between cultural norms and everyday reality is a key point to remember as we continue to explore the mystery of the powerful priestesses. The idea that people's actual lived experiences might not follow the social script collectively established as cultural norms certainly is not a new one. After all, the whole concept of deviance involves people violating such norms, and those norms themselves are often shifting and evolving. For example, Americans are drifting rapidly away from an earlier norm that treated sexual contacts between people not married to each other as wicked and harmful deviance. But when a situation develops in which a whole society has shifted its behavior in this way, so that traditional normative beliefs about how things should be no longer match the way things actually are, this discrepancy can be a sore spot if you bring it up in conversation. This is precisely what Sarah was doing over and over again in her conversations with people in Okinawa. She kept asking them why women occupied all the social high ground in religious rituals. Her respondents had two choices. First, they could have admitted that this situation was true and real, and then given her a coherent, consistent explanation for it based on some kind of official cultural explanation. This is the kind of response that Sarah calls ideological. And this is precisely the kind of answer that her respondents absolutely refused to provide. They would not give such an answer because they didn't have one that worked. 
Instead of getting mad at her for bringing up an awkward inconsistency in their lives, these Okinawans were always polite and respectful to her. They had several very useful strategies for deflecting her question so they didn't have to admit that they had no clear ideological answer for it. One of these strategies involved answering her question about why all religious leaders were women by changing the terms of the conversation. Instead of using words like all or always, respondents would start talking about particular individuals, giving names of this person or that person, and hoping that eventually Sarah would lose track of the forest from looking at particular trees and forget about her question. This tried and true way to avoid conflict and prevent arguments came up many times, and she gives lots of examples of it. A second strategy that she discovered among her respondents drew boundaries in time and space, answering her questions about all women by explaining that she wasn't actually observing all women, only women in that one particular place and only in the present moment of time. You may see that all these religious leaders, right here and right now, do happen to be women, but this is just a local historical accident. At other times, or perhaps in other places, or possibly both, it is possible that some men also are or have been religious leaders. You never know. Don't assume that just because you see all these powerful priestesses around here today, that this is some kind of cultural rule valid in all times and places. Yet a third strategy is, as Sarah describes, even more quintessentially sociological in its approach. Yes, they say, it does seem to be true that right now all the religious leaders here do seem to be women. But they've become leaders not because they are women, in the sense that nobody but women is allowed to take these leadership roles, but because these particular women have experienced certain other things in their lives that led them to these positions. Anybody else could have done the same thing, including men, if they had just followed the same social path. What is this path? Well, first of all, the women are around all the time because they're taking care of business at home, while the men are gone off doing various other stuff a lot of the time. Also, the women live a lot longer than the men, so they've been around long enough to learn all the rituals and the songs. That's why it's the old women doing it, because the young women don't know the songs yet, and neither do the men, since they're not around consistently to learn them. This social path explanation, again, deflects the question away from a focus on gender roles in religion, bringing age and the life cycle into the picture, or shifting the gender role question away from religion itself to other institutional dimensions of social life. In summary, Sarad provides a very instructive discussion not only of the details of a unique situation in which women systematically do dominate positions of power and authority in the religious life of a society, but also of the strategies that people in that society use to avoid talking to her about the apparent contradiction between this real life situation and the more abstract norms that they claim exist within their culture. When actual practices in everyday life don't match with the rules of life that people still recognize and claim to believe, you will make them uncomfortable if you point out such discrepancies. They will find ways to shut off your question. In a polite society like Okinawa, these ways are indirect and diplomatic. In another context, people might simply become defensive, angry, insulted, and hostile. Instead of deflecting your questions, they might beat you up and dump you by the side of the road. Susan Sarrett is fortunate that she found a polite society to study. In the larger perspective of a planet with human societies scattered all across its surface, we might well ask whether this Okinawa setting is the only place where powerful priestesses control religious life. We know that the borrowing explanation won't work and that they didn't get this idea from any of their neighbors. Sarah is left with her own explanation, since the people there simply refused to give her one, that this situation arose out of the fact that the place provided very scanty natural resources to support a human society. The men took off in their boats to look for better opportunities leaving the women to forage for limited supplies of food and other resources. In the process, these women developed and came to control their own institutionalized religious beliefs and rituals. 
If this explanation is correct, we ought to be able to search around for other similar settings and check on whether powerful priestesses also show up there in charge of religion. One possibility might be a place like Iceland in the North Atlantic, a barren volcanic island with lots of snow and ice and very little good agricultural land, where the men have a long history of taking off in boats to look for better opportunities, again leaving the women to forage for limited supplies of food and other resources. Do we find a similar tradition of powerful priestesses emerging in Iceland and control of religious life? So far as I know, we do not. You may be able to think of other comparable situations where such comparative research might take place. Who knows, maybe one day you will write another book like Susan Sarah did and advance our understanding of this question another step forward.